So, all right, so uh, my name is Lisa. I graduated here, like Drew said, 2009, so many moons ago. I am a game designer. I currently work at Bungie, but in the past I've worked at Insomniac, I've worked with Heart Machine, and I've done a lot of independent stuff, a little academic stuff. Here's a smattering of some of the games I've worked on. So these range from great big games with great big teams with millions of players to teeny tiny personal games I made with a couple other people. That are Just a whole, whole range. So today I want to talk to you about sort of my journey about where I was before I came to the ETC, the sort of stuff I did here and how I carried those lessons forward into my career and just end with a few key uh, lessons that I think really helped for my time here at the ETC. So, before the ETC, uh, I had a very eclectic skill set. Uh, my background, I had some artistic skills, some technology skill. So I went to undergrad, I went to a liberal arts school, and um, just tried everything, right? So I had two majors. One of my majors was in art, so I did a lot of painting, I did glass blowing, a lot of like traditional art was really fun. Uh, then I, I, had, I did computer science, which this is not a picture of my computer, but I was so like, this is basically my computer from undergrad, and I found it. So that did art and computer science. I was also really involved in the theater. I built props and did puppetry for the theater. And, you know, these were the things I was doing in school. So I was like, well, I'm learning these things. I guess I need a career in one of these things because that's how it works. Uh, but at the time, I was also doing a lot of stuff that was game design related, but I didn't realize it. So in hindsight, I look back on uh, some of the things I was doing on my own for fun. You know, I DM'd a lot of D&D uh, &D campaigns, you know, as a, as a high school student and in college, uh, which is very much game design. I had this thing with my family where every year for Halloween, we would like build a haunted yard experience for the neighborhood kids to go through. And I was responsible for figuring out like what the path was and when the jump scares should happen and all this stuff. And that was something super fun that I look forward to. And of course I played a lot of games and I got into modding uh, for Doom, Doom 2 actually, back in the day. I loved the game. I discovered there was a level editor and I was like, oh, this is great. And, but to me, it was a game, you know, it wasn't, this was stuff I was doing for fun, so I didn't really make any connection about, like, this is stuff I could do as a career. So, you know, I, I graduated from undergrad, I worked in the theater for a little bit, figured out it wasn't for me, I worked as a web developer for a little bit, but ultimately something was always missing, right? I, when I worked as a web dev, I missed the artistic side. When I was in the theater, I missed the tech side. So I was like, I need to do something with my life that combines all these skill sets. And so for me, going to the ETC was a step. I was like, I'm gonna go to graduate school and figure out what that is. So I uh, went on to the ETC. Here's me, many moons ago, learning how to fail. <laughs> so, you know, I was there, I was there years ago. And, um, you know, it was a really exciting time for me because it, it was just like, oh, I'm going to get to work with all these people and all this crazy stuff and figure out, figure out my place, right? So, you know, I had BVW, like all of you, these were some of the worlds I did. And, you know, they were fun. Some of them were really good, and some of them were like, eh. And some of them, I had team troubles, but we figured it out, and I learned a lot from them. Pretty typical. But I still wasn't sure what I wanted to do. Uh, and again, in hindsight, looking back, there were a couple of moments that should have been clues for me. So, uh, for example, we, one, this is one of the, the worlds I made is called Amoeba Prom. And the platform was this horrible platform that I don't think they make you use anymore, which was these remote controls uh, that, that like you could use, like a bunch of people could use a remote control to in, interact with a world. And they were really hard to, because they had this really, really high input latency. 
So you'd like press a button and it would be a, a, f a full beat before the game would register it. And we were trying to make this action game, right? You played as this amoebas and you were running around eating things and you got bigger and whoever was biggest at the end won. You could eat each other, it was fun. And, and we ran into this problem of like, how can we make an action game that feels responsive when we're working with this controller that has this horrible input latency? And I remember encountering that and being like, oh, this is a really interesting problem, right? I'm like, really, how do we do this? What's the solution? I remember being really engaged with solving that problem. In the end, the way we solved it was these amoebas, you know, they do this little like swimming motion. And we made it so that you couldn't put another input in until the swimming motion was finished. So you'd press up and swim, and then you would press right, but it wouldn't turn right unless it was done swimming. And so that sort of compensation, people figured it out, and they were able to play the game so that it felt responsive, and uh, we figured out it was great. But I didn't really think much of that. It was just like, ah, oh, this is a fun problem to solve. But that should have been a clue for me, right? That that's like maybe game design was a thing, because in game design, you're solving problems like that all the time. So that was my BBW. My first semester project was a student pitch project called Bandology. And it was a game that had, it was not a music game. It had nothing to do with music. It just, the theme was you were in a band. Uh, and we were trying to make a game, the goal was to make a game where someone with a really high skill level and someone with like a low skill level could still play together and, and have fun. And um, the, uh, at the time, it was, it was an asynchronous cooperative game. So it's like you would play the game as like a puzzle game and how well you did affected the next person on your team to play. So if you did super well at certain points in the song, it would send them power-ups when they played. And the thing was, uh, this wasn't very common at the time, this idea of asynchronous cooperative play. This was before Facebook games were big and the Facebook game era was sort of a time when asynchronous co-op was became really popular. But at the, this time, it wasn't really a thing. So it, one of the big challenges was explaining this experimental game concept to advisors and stuff in a way that made sense, because people, it was like a stretch for people to understand. Uh, but it was super fun. Um, and on this project, I, I wasn't sure exactly what I was doing. I was doing game design, but I wasn't sure that's what I was doing. I was like, well, I'm helping with this character creator and I'm doing some animation and some coding. So I'll just put like programmer slash animator on my business card, uh, which is a thing you see a lot with students. How many of you have ever had a business card that had like three, two or three roles on it? Like coder slash writer slash designer. All right, yes, yes, that's, that's a common thing. Don't do that, just pick something. <laughs> uh, whenever I'm at a conference and, and someone a student gives me a business card with like programmer, writer, designer. I'm like, ah, this person doesn't know what they want to do. So, because uh, I've been there, I was there. Um, but a thing that solidified my role as a designer is at the same time as this project, I was, uh, doo -doo -doo -doo, there we go, taking you know the game design class at the same time. And the reason I took this class was. Uh, I heard a bunch of people in my class saying that they wanted to be game designers, and I was like, I don't really understand what game design is, so I'll take this class to learn. And what happened was, I got into the process of doing game design, and I discovered, ooh, I really like this problem set. Like, these are really engaging problems to solve. They make me excited. It was like, reminded me of that moment back on Amoeba Prom. And so this was like a big turning point for me, where I was like, oh, I should be a game designer. Oh, that makes sense. And then I would say this to everyone, and they'd be like, well, obviously, Lisa. And I'm like, what do you mean, obviously? It wasn't obvious to me. Everyone else, they're like, oh, yeah, you're a good designer. And I'm like, but I didn't know that's what I was doing, was game design. So, you know, this, this whole process of making these analog games and play testing them and iterating on them just was, uh, that was, that was a compelling experience to me. So I was never the sort of person, like, even though I played a lot of games, I was never the sort of person who was like, oh, I have this dream game that I want to make. So I want to become a game designer so I can make this dream game. For me, it was the other way around. It was like, I tried game design. I was like, oh, this is an engaging problem set that I really like. I'll just do this. Uh, and it worked out. 
So that summer, the first summer after my uh, first year, I got an internship with Insomniac Games, uh, working on Resistance 2, which was a PS3 uh, first-person shooter, like post-apocalyptic sort of, you know, mutant alien type situation. Uh, and this was an interesting experience because it was their first design internships. And when I was uh, on the phone with the guy, the lead of the design, design lead, who was gonna, you know, I was gonna work with, and he's like, I'm gonna be honest with you, we don't really know what we're gonna do with you because we've never had a design intern before, so we're not quite sure how it's gonna work, but we'll figure it out. And I was like, all right, that sounds great. So I got there and basically they're like, well, we don't know what a design intern should be, so we're just gonna treat them like a junior designer and just give them work that we would give a junior designer as if we hired them. And that ended up being a great intern experience because I was getting literal hands-on experience with what it was like to work as a designer in the industry. And if the game design class and the first project were things that sort of got me on the path of, oh yeah, game design, I think that's the thing. This internship was like, okay, this is the thing. I found it, this is the thing I am. So pre-internship Lisa and post-internship Lisa were two completely different people. Uh, it was very transformative. So I come back to the ETC for my second semester. Uh, I get on another project, student pitch project called Get In Line. This was a project that was all about uh, creating entertainment experiences for captive audiences. So people who are like waiting in line at the amusement park or you know, waiting in a theater. And it was super fun. And you might see this now pretty commonly where you're like in the line and it's like play this game with your phone. But this was before smartphones. So smartphones like just came out, they were not ubiquitous. So most people just had flip phones and we figured out a way to leverage that to let people play together. We were really interested in games that people in line could play together. And so I, my role on this was game designer. So I, you know, I designed a lot of mini games that we played, but I also contributed to the design of the whole experience. Uh, and it was really a really great experience. It was a fun, a fun project. And my last semester at the ETC, I did another internship, a co-op, over at Shell Games, because I wanted to get uh, a different sort of studio experience. I'd started to learn that the role of game designer is super different depending on the studio, depending on the game, the genre. It's like what you do as a designer can vary a lot. So I wanted to get sort of a experience that was really different from the stuff I'd been working on this summer. So I ended up, you know, I did a lot on Pixie Hollow, the Disney Fairies MMO, which was an incredible game. It was really great. I did some mini game design. I did some quest design for their like wilderness activity. So it was fun. It was really different. I got a really different experience. And um, that was sort of like the, the gist of my, my time here at the ETC. So it's time to graduate. Um, Insomniac had been like, you know, you're cool, come back after you graduate. And I was like, all right. <laughs> uh, a key thing to remember is if you get an internship, an internship is essentially a three month long interview. Uh, so, you know, that treat them as such. So, uh, you know, I set off, I set off across the country to start my career as a game designer. So quick question, who here wants to be a game designer? Raise your hands. All right, okay, okay. All right, now, now try this. Everyone close your eyes, close your eyes. Now keep your eyes closed. Raise your hand if you actually have no fucking clue what a game designer does in their day-to-day -day life. All right, all right, good, good. Lower your hands, lower your hands, open your eyes. All right, so I was one of you second people. When I was at the ETC, my classmates would be like, what are you gonna do? And my classmates would be like, I'm gonna be a game designer. And I was like, whoa, that sounds like some specialized role that people understand what it is, and I don't know what that is, so I guess that's not for me. And obviously that wasn't true, because here I am. But one of the reasons it's, it's so difficult to convey what a designer does is, again, the role a game designer plays is very different depending on the game, the genre, the studio, the point in the project. 
But at the end of the day, it's always about solving problems for the game and being an ambassador for the player. So you are, you are sort of um, curating the player experience in the game. Uh, Jason Vandenberg used to say that you can define a role by um, whose fault it is when things go wrong. So like, you know, if the game crashes, it's the programmer's fault. If the game is late, then it's the producer's fault. If the game isn't fun or if the game is a bad player experience, it's the designer's fault. So that sort of a, is, is one way of defining it. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to go through some of the games I've worked on in the past 10 years. And I'm going to take one problem from um, each game that I had to solve, like actually had to solve as a designer in my job, to hopefully give you a little sampling of the sorts of things that you have to do as a designer. So first off, when I got to Insomniac, and I was a designer on Resistance 3, which was a sequel to the game that I was an intern on. Again, it's a first-person shooter. Um, you know, I was responsible for some different levels. At Insomniac at the time, the design roles were a little generalist, so I did a little level design, a little combat design, so on. One of the things that I had to do was uh, the last level in the game, another designer had built it, had did the level design, and did like first pass of all the combat, but then they had some other thing they had to deal with, so they were like, Lisa, go through and revise all the combat in this, in this level. Um, cause, but I didn't like make the level, I was already working with something that existed. So here's a problem we faced. We had this particular room in the game that was, it was a great big room and there were two sides and they were really symmetrical, the two sides. And what would happen is players would come in, they would get in combat, they'd win the fight, they'd inevitably like, you know, they'd get turned around and end up on the side they came in, and when they were done, they would end up backtracking by accident because they didn't realize they were turned around. So our problem was, okay, we have this big room, it's kind of symmetrical, how do we convey to players like which side is which so they know where they are without changing any of the art because we were, it was late in the project, we didn't have time to redo the art. So we sat down together to figure this out, we did a couple things, we're like, okay, so, one side, the side you come in, we're going to keep it dark, and the other side we're going to be like brightly lit, uh, so that you know that's a big change. So we solve some stuff with lighting, and in the first room, um, I didn't put any combat encounters in there. It was like a quiet place with pickups that you could sort of sneak through to scope out the other room. We also had these blue lasers that were really iconic. So we're like, okay, we're only gonna put blue lasers in the second half and not in the first half. And then all the combat's gonna be in the second half. And you know, you know, through play testing, it, it ended up working. People would go in, they'd get in combat, you know, sometimes they'd like go back and forth between the halves. But at the end, they knew where they were. If they ended up in the first half, they, they understood immediately that uh, that was where they came in. And so they were able to find their way out. So that's like a little, little level design, combat design problem. So another game we worked on was Sunset Overdrive. This was a third person shooter, but it was a really weird third person shooter because it had a lot of traversal and the combat was all integrated with the traversal. You know, you were grinding on rails and wall running and whatnot. Uh, and this was a super fun project. But very, very, very early on in pre-production, we were prototyping. Uh, this is what it looked like. Um, and we found that, like, we knew we wanted it to be, like, in the city setting, but we found that, like, you know, flat city streets were like really boring and not really compelling. And this was supposed to be a game with this punk energy. And we were just like, I don't know, it's just not, we're not feeling it. So one of the designers pointed out that he was thinking about high fantasy games like Skyrim. And in Skyrim, you, you have these situations where you're exploring and you turn a corner and there's like this beautiful magical place with like waterfalls and it looks like super magical and, and just feels really inspiring. And we were like, can we replicate that feeling in an urban setting? Like, can we get that feeling of like excitement and exploration and sort of a feeling of a magical place with an urban setting. And that's sort of the problem we were trying to solve. So we did sort of a little game jam 
uh, just making prototypes of level layouts. And we ended up, um, this one's kind of hard to see, but we ended up with these prototypes where we had all these vertical layers. This one's really dark, but you know, there's like multiple paths over to these vertical layers. We even snuck a waterfall in, and we, we sort of figured out that this sort of um, like asymmetrical verticality layering thing, you know, started to get that feeling for, oh, that's the feeling we want. You know, when we go for it, we're sort of exploring this crazy city. And then that became the foundation for like a lot of the traversal mechanics, and it became a really defining part of the game. Like in the end, when you go through the city, there's all these like secret nooks and different platforms and like different heights that you approach things and you can round a corner and just like, like, you know, encounter this space that just feels really bizarre and magical. And that's how we got there. <clears throat> so at one point at Insomniac, the company was doing some experiments. Um, we had our big games, but they wanted to experiment with like different types of games and, and small games. And I was fortunate enough to get picked to do an experiment where the goal was to make a small game with like five people, like a team of five people, more close to what project size y'all are working on. And so I uh, pitched and made this small little action game. It, uh, it was called Slow Down Bull, and it was a game about being a stressed out overachiever bull who wants to do everything perfectly, but who gets really stressed out when they mess up and charges and tramples everything. So it was like this little action game where you were running around collecting things, uh, but if you did, didn't do things perfectly, you would get stressed out. Everything in the game stressed you out. And if you got too stressed out, you would charge and trample all the stuff you were trying to collect. Uh, and this was a, I took this opportunity to sort of take an indie approach to it and be like, I want to make a game that has like very personal meaning to me because you know, this was something I struggled with. Like, who here is a stressed out overachiever? Come on, be honest. Yeah, you know what it feels like, right? And I wanted to make a game that explored those feelings. So the problem I had to solve here was I had a, a small team of three other people or four other people, one, two, three, yes, I can count four other people. Uh, who were basically contractors for helping me make this game. And the problem I wanted to solve was, how can I take this really personal game concept that's personal to me and find a way that these other people can feel ownership over the idea so that like they can relate to it. So it's not just me like being like, sound person, I need this list of sounds, make me these sounds, you know, so that I can feel integrated on the team. And so this concept and theme that was really personal to me could also be personal to them. And so this was a lot of working with the individual members to like figure out how this sort of story related to them, like, situ like aspects of the characters that they could relate to and really encouraging people to be involved in all parts of the creative process uh, to sort of bring this thing to life. So here's an example of a design problem that like, this is more about the team aspect, like the team layer. And you'll find that as a designer, even if you're like a junior, you're not in a lead position, you often have to take sort of leadership roles in bringing the team together and getting everyone on the same page and getting everyone to take ownership over the vision. So that's something you do a lot as a designer. So then, you know, I went indie for a while. I worked with Heart Machine on the game Hyperlight Drifter, which is an action RPG. They brought me on to help them with level design. And right away, uh, one of the problems I was to solve is like, okay, they've brought me on to do level design. So far, all of my level design experience is in these big 3D games, like first person, third person games. I had never worked on a 2D action game before. I'd never done level design for a 2D action game. So one of the problems I was like to solve was, okay, how can I figure out what part of my level design skills transfers from this like 3D stuff that I've been doing to this 2D world? And if you want to know the answer to that, I gave a whole GDC talk about it <laughs> that you could go watch. Uh, so if you're interested in level design, uh, maybe check that out. But um, yeah, so those are some examples of like real problems from my job that I solve. And it's just a smattering. Game designers solve 
a whole range of problems from technical problems to aesthetic problems to player behavior psychology problems, like a whole different range. And that to me is really exciting because I like you know, mixing it up a lot. So I'm gonna pivot a little bit. One thing I wanna talk about is um, for, uh, you know, when you guys are working on your projects here, you're usually working on small teams on a whole project, and uh, it's a really good experience, but it can be a different from when you're working on a huge team on a AAA game. So I want to go through like a process that um, I go through at work and how other teammates are involved to just give you sort of look about what it's like uh, to make something on one of these projects. So I work on Destiny 2. Uh, who is familiar with Destiny 2? Okay, so most, yeah. It's a, a first person shooter like MMO. It's like got sci-fi and space magic and, and it's great. And it has these items, uh, exotics, which are like armor and weapons that are power items. Like if you put on an exotic, it modifies your ability in some way so you can do something new and they're really cool. And so I uh, was tasked with creating all the exotic armor for the Forsaken expansion last year. And I want to go through the process I did for designing one of these pieces of armor. This is called Antaeus Wards. This is some leg armors for Titans, one of our player classes. And the way it works is when you slide on the ground, you can reflect projectiles back at the person who shot them to you. So I'm gonna take you through like the process of what it was like to design these things. Uh, so first of all, um, I'm not, I, I don't, I have a lot of freedom in what I get to make. It's like, they're just basically like, we need X number of exotics, go. And so I'm like, all right, I have to figure out where to start. Uh, and usually uh, with exotics, I, I start a number of different ways. Sometimes it's like, oh, we, we got this new ability in the game recently. Maybe I should make something that riffs off of this new ability that we got and so it can come from a gameplay mechanic place. But sometimes it can come from like a thematic fantasy place. So it's like, oh, the Forsaken expansion, it's all about revenge, the theme is all about revenge. So I should make something that's all about this feeling of vengeance and this fantasy of vengeance. And that's like the starting point for the design. So there's a lot of different ways you can start. For these Antaeus Wards, uh, I started out, I was looking for gaps, I was looking for things that you could do in the game that really hadn't had an exotic like play with them before. So uh, sliding was one of these. You can slide in our game, but we hadn't really done anything to play off of sliding before. So I was like, I'll start with that. Uh, so that was like a mechanical thing. And then aesthetically, I was looking at all the exotics we'd done for Titans, and most of them were sort of like very sci-fi, very like, space police, robocop, military feeling. So I was like, okay, so, so we got a lot of those. Let's see if we can do something that brings in more of the space magic feel that we have in Destiny to, you know, because there's like a gap there. Uh, then after that, um, something we do is come up with a gameplay fantasy and an emotional fantasy as like a sort of a core thing to inspire everything else. So it's like, okay, what are these fantasies for this armor? So for the gameplay fantasy, it's like, okay, the fantasy, I'm gonna do something with sliding. How about like sliding kicks back projectiles to the enemy, that's cool. And then for an emotional fantasy, it's like, okay, this is about sliding. I wanna do more space magic-y feel. So let's say it's something about, this is drawing power from the earth to protect me somehow. Very high level sort of feeling. And so I take this to the team and like pitch it around and get people's feedback on it and everyone's like, yeah, yeah, let's do that. So then like we get a uh, concept artist involved. We're like, what are these things gonna look like? So I give them, I'm like, here's what it's gonna do. Here's the gameplay fantasy. Here's the emotional fantasy. Make something that conveys those fantasies. So this person, like the person who did this concept art, they're like, okay, they're getting that earth inspiration. They're definitely doing something more space magic-y. Maybe these vents are the things a shield comes from, you know. They're the ones coming up with like sort of the concept. And then, you know, we prove that. That gets passed off to the artists and they do that magic thing where you turn a gray cube into an asset. It's a very mysterious process for me. I'm not an artist. Um, but, you know, they're artists and tech artists that get it rigged and whatnot. 
Meanwhile, I'm like playtesting this idea um, before we even have the art, just playtesting this idea. Of what does it feel like to knock projectiles back? In PvP, what does it feel like when someone reflects your projectile back at you? Like, does that feel terrible? Does it feel fair? Like, is it fun? Like, you know, is it enough? It's a pretty high risk thing you're doing is, you know, figuring out this stuff. Meanwhile, the programmers are involved because um, they're basically creating things that I can use to build this perk. Like, they created the component that I can put on, you know, the player that creates, a, it's called a projectile response, and I can set it to reflect the projectile when it hits the object. And then later on, I was like, it wasn't quite, like, it was pretty risky to do this, so I wanted to give a little more payoff, so I was like, okay, if you successfully reflect something, I'll give you a little super energy. So I, I needed a way to detect if they had successfully reflected something. So I worked with the programmer, and they, they gave me um, like a per activation trigger that I could listen to this event for. So you know, the programmers are involved along the way as well. And then you know, I got something working, people like it, and then it's like, all right, we're going to do this. Comes to balancing stuff, you know, should the shield block all the damage? Like, is that too overpowered? So some maybe some damage should come through the shield. Like, how much should that be? How long should the shield stay up? Um, should it reflect everything? We say it reflects projectiles. Does that mean every projectile in the game, even from like the big bad boss, even another player super? Like, yes, no. Uh, what does that mean? How do you communicate that? And, you know, if you're getting super energy back, how much should it be? Because too much and it's overpowered and too little, it's not worth it. You have to find the right amount. Should there be a cooldown on this? Like, so you do it once, like, should you be able to do it right away or does it need to be a cooldown? How long should the cooldown be? Um, so on and so forth. These are the sort of questions I'm trying to answer. Then you get like visual effects and audio involved. like. What does the shield object look like? What is it made out of? Is it solid? Is it energy? Is it like, what should it be? And then, you know, the effects artist is working off, you know, effects conventions, but also the fantasy. Well, it's supposed to be space magic y, so maybe we'll make it like Traveler's Light energy. And, you know, audio is going in there, figuring out what should it sound like when you successfully reflect something. You know, they're figuring that out. Then, of course, you got QA, you know, they're testing this thing against every weapon in the game. They're trying to find exploits that it might be able to cause. They're like, is the art itself working properly? You know, is the shield going away when it's supposed to? If I do some crazy sequence of events, maybe, you know, it's not going away. You know, are the effects showing up properly at the right time? All this stuff. And then writers get involved, right? Because our exotics have lore. So the writer, like, you know, they helped me come up with the name of these things, because I'm terrible at naming things. These were called slide pants for the longest time. <laughs> I'm like, these are the slide pants. And so working with the artist, she was like, again, back to that emotional fantasy, back to that original concept. It's like it's about drawing energy from the earth. So she called them Antaeus wards, which is this, it, it represents the shielding aspect of it. It has this like nice little mythological aspect connection to the earth. And she's coming up with, with like, where did these come from? What's the story behind these? How can these expand the universe? Uh, and then that's like the creative writing side. There's technical writing involved, right? These things have perks. We have to write them so that they're concise so players can read them and immediately understand what does this do. Uh, so that's way more on the technical writing side. There's UI, user interface. They have to make an icon for this thing. What should the icon look like? How can the icon represent what it does. There's economy design, like how should this thing be rewarded? Which the drop rate be? And then there's marketing, you know, and they've got to figure out how to get players excited about this. And they make like, you know, this cool video where it's like, oh my God, that person reflected that guy's rocket and blew him up, oh, it's so cool. So there's a lot of people involved with the making of just this one thing. But it isn't like, you know, this isn't all like one process, it's not like, oh, we just like carry this through and then it's done. It's like, at the same time I'm making this, I'm making six other exotics, right? The artists are making all the armor. The effects artists are supporting other abilities, other, other things, like it's, it's a parallel iterative process for everything. But hopefully that gives you a little bit of an idea of like how this all comes to play in a big studio where maybe you're only working on one little slice of the game. All right, 
So I'm going to go over a couple of things that I really felt that I learned at the ETC that really have come into play in my career. Um, and the main thing <laughs> is, you are bit, spoiler alert, you're getting a master's degree in teamwork. Like, this is the biggest thing that I took from the ETC that helped me like get a jump start in the industry. Uh, all that stuff, even down to like the very first thing, you know, how to work in teams class from BBW with like the tips, you know, all that stuff, that stuck with me and it still comes into play. Because something I found that I was surprised uh, was when I got on a team, you know, with people in the industry, sometimes they've been in the industry way, way longer than I, and sometimes they weren't used to someone coming in and wanting the whole team to be invested. Like, um, this is my team from Resistance 3. We worked on the traversal levels together. And I was like, come on, guys, let's get a team picture. And they're like, what, a team picture? We've never done, we've never done something like that before. Uh, and um, this, this person in particular, this is Craig, he was an a environment artist, and he's been in the industry like a billion years, basically. Yeah. And I remember him saying, like, he was not used to working with designers who wanted everyone to have buy-in on the project. Like, he had had some bad experiences with designers who, who were like, came in and were like, make this, do it like this. And so, like, when I brought in all that team dynamic, like it got people really, it made people really happy and we worked together as a team. And that sort of, that trend carried through with like every project I worked on using those things I worked about working on a team. Every time I started on a new team, even to this day, I go out to lunch with the people and you know, the whole thing about the food and just like find ways to connect with my team and you can see it come through and the photos that like, you know, the teams that love each other and love the project makes the game better. Like that thing is absolutely true. And I absolutely has carried through. And in fact, here's a group of people I worked with at Insomniac. But this is years later. This is after a lot of us have left, gone on to other projects. But like we still come together and that time we spent together making those things and that bond we shared was important and made the games better as a result. So that is like super key. Another thing that I really took away from the ETC was this idea of your work having impact. Like the, the stuff you're doing and the entertainment you're creating, having a real impact, a positive impact on people and being able to change people's lives. And that's something that's always been stuck with me. Um, and one thing like it drove me to do is like to really think about why. Why do I make games? And really sit down and like why? And for me, you know, I you know this answer is different for everyone, obviously. I make games because I really like people. I really think that that social connection is important. I want to forge a connection with people through this artifact of my game, but I also want to create something that can forge connections between people. And so this is important in my work. And I think it's one reason I really have a great time at Bungie because that's like something they try really hard to do with Destiny. In fact, this is uh, what's outside, what's on the wall outside of our studio, outside the entrance of Bungie. We create worlds that inspire friendship. And that's sort of the goal. Like, sure, we're making like a really great shooter and it's fun and you can play it with other people, but it's really like a platform to forge connections between people. And I want to show this example. So we, uh, you know, we released a lot of marketing videos. And it's all about like showing how much a badass you are with this gun. And, like, oh, this game's so cool. But I remember when we released this one, which this is an advertisement for our Refer a Friend program. I remember people after seeing this and thinking they're like, oh, that's it. That's the real Destiny experience. Like, this is the real stuff. So I just want to show you this this goofy ad that people were like, oh, hang on, hang on. I have to get audio. Oh, this is the worst UX. Google Slides, this is the worst. I'll just jump to YouTube. Make it big. <laughs> Thank you for being a friend. <laughs> Your heart is true, you're a bad and a confidant. <laughs> 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 Thank you for being a friend. Thank you for being a friend. 
So we released this, you know, to advertise or for a friend. But I remember when it came out and people were like, oh, look, it's the actual, it's the real Destiny experience. Like, that's, that's what it's like to play a game. Like, all the stuff we'd done with, you know, all the, the cool, oh, man, oh, man, present. Like, don't start back at the beginning. Don't start back at the beginning. Oh, yeah, yeah, did it. Did it. Sorry, nailed it. Um, and it, it stuck out to me. It's like, yeah, we have this cool game about fighting aliens, but this game means a lot to a lot of people. Like, this is a game where the connections that people have forged through it have been incredibly important to them and sometimes life-saving to them. And that, to me, has been, like, extremely valuable. But I want to point out, like, not everyone is going to work on huge AAA games with millions of players. Uh, but this value comes through no matter the size of the game. Small games can do this too. And I want to give an example. So I made a game for a project called Meditations. Uh, this is a game where, or a project where a bunch of designers got to better get together and you picked a day and you made a small little game like less than five minutes experience and make it in like a weekend, right? It's just a small, fast little game. So it's just supposed to convey something about that day. And so I made this little game about uh, one of the challenges I face is I have a chronic illness and I often like suffer from depression as a result. So I wanted to make a game about that experience of like being in a like really happy place, having a good time surrounded by people, and then like suffering a depressive episode after that. And I was so I made this little game where you're trying to drag this little ragdoll person over into the next room to be with their friends. And that was like, you know, that's the game. And so I want to show you a video um, of a Let's Player uh, who played this game. They were playing all the Meditations game, and just sort of uh, jump through. I'll jump through a few places so you can see like how this tiny game that I made in a weekend resonated with someone. So, and this isn't like a super popular guy with a million viewers. This is just someone doing this as like a hobby, so. Game launcher would load the game up. I'll read it for you. Uh, when you suffer from a major depressive disorder, sometimes an intense, joyous occasion can crash down into despair with no negative stimuli or logical cause. I know that feeling incredibly well, yes. Quiet here. <laughs> and so, like, your figures out, and starts fingering out the game. <laughs> so you play this little fairy, just trying to trying to get this person over. Oh my god! I, I already adore this. Come on! Oh my god! I, I know this feeling too now. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. All right. Like, and you'll notice he plays way longer for, than five minutes. Like, this is a game you could play in, like, you know, a couple of minutes if you wanted. And he just, like, kept going trying to get this person, like, over the wall. And he's just like trying, 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 trying. Pull back, pull back. And so on and so forth and so on and so forth. And he just keeps, he keeps playing because you can fall in that pit at the end. He just keeps going. Let's go. Oh my God. Come on, Lisa. We are, we are over the pit. Do this. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> not allowed. Not this one danger. Let's blank in. Whatever it's like, just go. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Room of love. We made it. We saved you, Lisa. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were really over that. Mm -hmm. Again, like the game yesterday, it delivered, it, it, it delivered a message in a way I feel only a game could. And I, I didn't realize while doing that. Well done, again. Mm -hmm. That was absolutely, uh, that was on point. Mm -hmm. Well done. Uh, <laughs> that was, uh, that was emotional. 
oh, that, honestly, I genuinely feel good for persevering and pulling her through. I, that's so weird. <laughs> oh, man, man. These, uh, these, these feeling games get me good. I have to admit, I absolutely adore the fact that something like that can be put forward in such a simple way. With just heaving someone over that pit of despair into the room of love. <laughs> we all need to just... Ah. I'll calm down a bit now from that. Uh, and I just want to say that that game really hit hard for me. That game... I think weirdly compared to their different experience what I was expecting it to convey. My first impressions of the game were it showed you how it felt to be the person that is going through this, that's pushing through it and struggling it, uh, struggling through it. And that was certainly the thing that I got at first. But after I realised that you had to get Lisa <coughs> over the pit, it was a very different perspective on that game for me. It didn't become about experiencing depression, it became about being on the other side of that, being someone who is trying to get someone over, or uh, yeah, trying to get someone over that pit of despair and into that room of love. And I have a very long history with depression in particular. I was diagnosed 20 years ago. Uh, so it's been a very long battle for me. And it's one that I'm kind of winning, I guess. I don't know. Uh, I won't go too much into that. That's not really what this video is for. But a lot of my friends and family and incredibly dear people to me have gone through depression too. And I have also endured that struggle of trying to pull someone over that pit. And God knows friends have been in that struggle for me, trying to pull me over that pit. So I think the wonderful thing that that game did for me was show me both sides of that, two perspectives on that. And getting someone into that room, that was genuine joy you saw. That was genuine elation. I felt so good for not giving up on it, which is so dumb because it was just this stupid little fucking ragdoll thing. <laughs> but I was invested. I was really incredibly invested. So um, I'm going to leave some stuff in the comment, in the comments, in the um, uh, what's my jigger. Uh, you know, I'm thinking of it every night. Um, it'd be like suicide prevention stuff because it's a serious topic. Uh, something I won't cover in a, in a let's play, but, you know, if you do need to talk to someone and you haven't got someone who you trust that you can talk to, there are people who you can talk to. There are numbers that are like that. And uh, a huge thank you to Lisa for creating a game that really resonated with me in a lot of ways. And also thank you to you for watching. I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. So... So this, this, obviously, this game resonated with this person very strongly. I made a connection with this random person who I don't know through this game that mattered to him and changed him in some ways and let him forge a connection with other people in the form of his viewers. And this is just a small little side project game that's very tiny. Not many people have played it, probably like a handful, but it still matters. It's still makes an impact, and uh, that's important. And I want to, let's see, I want to end on an anecdote, uh, a little story that has stuck with me uh, for a while. So this is, this is a friend of mine, this is Maria. She's a doctor, she's a neonatologist, which is a sort of doctor who works with premature babies in neonatal intensive care, um, and this is her job. She and I have been friends for a long, long time, but like this is what she does every day is like work with these tiny sick babies. And I would often like when we're together, sometimes I would joke with her and be like, oh, you're, you're out there solving the real problems, right? I'm just solving made up problems all day. And, you know, and she, she told me, she's like, you know, Lisa, if I have a really bad day at work, like if I lose patience at work, and I come home and all I want to do is pick up a game and play some ridiculous, stupid game like Gang Beast. She loved Gang Beast. She's like, I just want to play Gang Beast or Mario Kart or something. And it brings me back. It grounds me. 
like it lets me like you know go to another world and like have an experience that can can bring me back so that I can face the next day and like my next set of patients and she said this thing she said games keep doctors healthy and I was like oh I love that I'm gonna remember that but her point was you know entertainment has an impact like it can be easy like in the world now with all like the shit going on to be like oh man Am I really doing the right thing, like making games? Is this, is this the right thing? But it can have an impact. It can help people. It can help the people who are on the front lines and, and be the thing that gives them the restorative energy they need to keep like doing the hard jobs. So if there's one thing I want you to take away is that the stuff you're doing can have a huge impact. And I think that's important to keep with you no matter what uh, you end up doing. So thank you for my talk. Yay, so good. <laughs>